Um, so I guess if you could kind of put a number on, on your base stress level, I mean, it, it, every healthcare professional, I think feels a certain amount of stress throughout the day, but it seems to be that nurses are maybe more taxed now than, uh, and recently than they have been in a long time. Uh, like on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is your breaking point and you're just, you're leaving, you're throwing your, you know, you're throwing your scrubs down, you're walking out the door. What was your average, do you think, day-to-day -day stress level like in that position? I think, you know, I couldn't say that it ever got below a six. Ooh, okay. um, there would there would be lulls in the day or, or you know, the day might start out okay, um, but could certainly go, get haywire really, really fast. Okay. And, um, and the nature of the job is that uh, there are no rules about things happening one at a time. And so, uh, you know, oftentimes when it rained, it poured. And uh, it wasn't unusual for there to be a sequence of events or a sequence of crises um, that needed to be dealt with. And on days where there was were staffing shortages and um, resource challenges, that meant it kind of fell back on on those of us who were there. Um, so the stress level could easily get up to a nine or a 10 and be sustained like that for, um, you know, three or four hours at a time. And maybe you'd have a little lull or you could catch your breath for a couple of minutes, but, but the baseline was a pretty high stress level. Okay. Yeah. That, uh, that sounds about, uh, on par with what I've been hearing. Um, so let's talk about the, uh, the uh, substance abuse issue. Um, could you give us kind of a, was there any particular scenario or was it a certain day uh, where things had, uh, you know, was stress a factor that drove you towards uh, what happened with uh, the substance? And I'll leave it up to you uh, to describe what the substance was and what, uh, and how it uh, kind of developed into a pattern for you. Yeah. So the, the substance of abuse for me was was hydromorphone and and opiates in general, but hydromorphone specifically. And um, in terms of how it sort of uh, developed or, or or culminated up to the point, I um, certainly hadn't named the factors that led to it at the time. So everything I am reflecting on is, of course, hindsight, and um, <clears throat> I wouldn't have called it anxiety at the time. I wouldn't have called it um, the result of trauma. Uh, and I wouldn't have called it the result of sort of my, uh, the uh, depletion of my mental reserves in my mental health. But at this point now, I can, I can certainly reflect on those being, being huge factors in turning towards opiates. Um, I had started to develop a, um, a feeling anxiety at work um, and uh, wasn't unusual on my shifts to be, you know, again, in hindsight, have a feeling of, of stress in my chest, pressure in my chest, <clears throat> feel flushed, feel like my heart was racing. And, and I can't recall the first specific times that I took opiates at work, but I certainly re remember knowing what a, um, how much it eased my, um, my, my feeling, my feeling of stress and anxiety. Right. And I think I do recall that, um, being aware at the time that the hook was almost instantaneous. Okay. <clears throat> um, and a question I, and I asked this because uh, I, I had, a, um, my substance of choice was opiates as well, uh, oxycontin and oxycodone to be specific. And the way the link, I think for me was formed between that substance and, um, the solace or the kind of sanctuary from stress that it provided. Yeah. I think that was formed long before I really put two and two together on a conscious level. Um, and I wonder, did you have any, like, was there a, a, maybe an accident where you required surgery or some kind of pain situation where you had a prescription and you'd had some experience with it and, and there was an opportunity there to form that kind of a relationship or 
was this something that you just you're you were there and you're just like you know what i can't take it anymore uh let's see if this helps that type of thing i you know i was aware of of opiates from my in my personal life um as a teenager i'd had a couple of uh of dental dental surgeries dental procedures that required me to have opiates mm -hmm. and i certainly remember the feeling um and then i remember um you know when i was about 15 or 16 um taking them recreationally and on an empty stomach when i didn't need them when i didn't have pain and of course that was when i that was when it was most pronounced to me that it, it created a euphoria created a feeling of comfort and solace and um and then it was years obviously many years later that i went back to that but um yeah that was my first experience it was probably you know almost 20 years before i ever came back to opiates okay yeah it's uh i think you know i, I hadn't really uh, considered this much before I, I really tried to start piecing together my own situation there but i think for most people there was probably some preliminary exposure to that where there was a little bit of a light that went on in their head because opiates don't do that for everybody. No. Um, and especially, you know, the, the, I think there's people out there who maybe only have that reaction with certain opiates, like, um, for example, maybe only hydromorph gave them that euphoria, whereas codeine didn't, or, you know, just as, as an example. Yeah. And, and that's right. Like I, I, I recall with codeine, um, and, and that's when I was in my teens, that was what I had tried. And that created actually a much more um, irritable feeling. Okay. And a, um, you know, a, a short temperedness. But I, I recall with, you know, the number of times I, I would give it to patients, give hydromorphone or opiates to patients and seeing that effect on them. And having given it to patients, you know, tens of thousands of times, you know, at times as a, as an ER nurse, you're giving, you're, you're, you're giving dosing opiates, you know, 20, 30 times a day to different patients. Right. So you're and seeing that effect as well. You're you are. seeing the, the peaceful glaze come over people's face and they calm down and maybe they go to sleep when they were very agitated before. So maybe that's a factor too. I didn't consider you know, and that's not to that's not to put to, to put blame on patients' pain requirements, but <clears throat> when you're constantly exposed to that and seeing that seeing that effect, um, and there's a sort of a reinforcement that that it does calm people down. Yeah, yeah, and I think these are all these type of uh, motivators or drivers are important to at least discuss 